Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is the head. He leads the Roman Catholic Church in Delhi as its Archbishop. He's in the tradition of his great master, Jesus Christ, in a sense, uh, who serves God by serving man. He's had rich and varied experience in numerous social projects, development issues around and across India. I'm delighted to welcome Archbishop Winston. Uh, we, we record this sort of, uh, you know, counting down to celebration of Christmas. And I think the sort of, you know, for, for most people from the outside at least, the images associated with Christmas are Santa Claus, parties, wine, late nights, and maybe church mass at, you know, at, at midnight. Yes. What is the real significance and the meaning of Christmas? Yes. Well, we celebrate the birthday of Jesus on Christmas, and the mystery behind it is that God became man for our salvation. And by becoming one of us, he ensured that salvation comes from within humanity. He became one of us. We do not understand how this happens. It's a mystery. But we believe by his inserting himself into our history, by becoming a part of humanity, he has enriched humanity. We believe that every person is made in the image and likeness of God. And by God's becoming man, in a sense, every human person is divinized. Mm -hmm. And that's why the whole question of loving our neighbor becomes much more meaningful. When you say that God becomes man, is there the, uh, the potential and the Christian aspiration of man becoming God? Uh, <laughs> in a sense, yes. We share divine life, and that is what is salvation all about. You know, uh, the present economy includes God's intervention in our salvation. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we believe is that only God can save. All that we do is nothing more than disposing ourselves mm -hmm. in our humility to surrender to God. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it is His action which makes us what we are. Do you, do you sort of regret the fact that much of the significance of uh, and the, the sacredness of Christmas uh, is, is, is diluted by spending, buying presents and, and parties and five-star hotels and, and, and you know, lights and, and the kind of celebration that isn't quite what, what uh, is representative of the sanctity sure. and, and, and the great depth and profundity yes, of what you're talking yes, about. Yes. That is not the heart of Christmas. Certainly, you need such an amount of uh, celebration, uh, families coming together, enjoying their, each other's company and so on. But the heart of Christmas is our awareness of God's presence in our midst, recognizing Him in one another, particularly in those who are poor, who are suffering, and see what we can do for them. That is the main thing. Uh, I, I remember coming across a uh, little story of uh, a man who went to the supermarket to buy presents for his family. And as he came out, he saw a little boy standing close to his car. And when the man came there, he asked him, uh, is this car yours? He says, yes. How much did you pay? And the man said, you know, I don't know uh, how much the cost is because this was given to me by my brother as a present on my birthday. And the boy, he was a poor boy in torn clothes, he said, uh, I wish, and the man thought he was going to say, I wish I had a brother like that. Instead he said, I wish I were a brother like that. <laughs> and he was amazed. Then he said, I have a little brother who is paralyzed. He would like to go around, but I am going to work hard, I am going to earn money, I am going to buy a car one day and take my brother around. Mm -hmm. This man was so uh, surprised by what he replied, you know, he said, where is your brother? He said, he lives in one of the slums here. Mm -hmm. He took him there, and this man took both of them around the city, took them to their supermarket, told them, buy what you want, mm -hmm. and I'll put the bill. Mm -hmm. 
So this is sort of, in a sense, a Santa Clausification of Christmas. Yeah, but, uh -huh. but this man said, reflecting on this, that was the day this little boy taught me how to celebrate Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not, mm -hmm. you know, spending uh, on drinks and uh, big celebrations. Certainly, certain Ramadan celebration mm -hmm. is good. But what do I do for my brother or sister mm -hmm. who is in need? Tell me, Santa Claus, where does Santa Claus fit into this? Just sort of uh, more, more fairly recent contemporary myth and tradition to, you know, sort of encourage consumerism or, or something. But also implicit in it is really a dilution of, of, of the Christian message yeah. because, you know, be good and Santa Claus will bring you something. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and if you're good, Santa Claus will give you something material. How to you as, as Archbishop and, and the custodian of the church and, <laughs> yeah, and the yeah, values yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of the Lord. Well, feel about Santa Claus. It's true that uh, <laughs> you know, the meaning of Santa Claus uh, is uh, sort of secularized, you know. But the message behind is sharing, sharing with those who do not have. Uh, there was a bishop, uh, Nicholas is his name, and he used to be very much concerned about the poor. It was in the line of his t tradition, sort of, the Santa Claus came up. But of course, now it has taken all types of expressions. Yeah, but the real meaning is, how do we share with those who do not have? You know, I, I, I noticed that you're wearing a, a, a wooden cross. Yes. And we have sort of traditionally associated uh, the Roman Catholic Church with, you know, with pomp and splendor. <laughs> uh, is this uh, 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 an inherent sort of statement of some kind? <laughs> well, I, I, I prefer a wooden cross. Uh, that's the original one. Uh, uh, besides, in India, particularly, uh, these things make no sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the simpler you are, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important value, also for Jesus, also for Indian spirituality. Mahatma Gandhi mm -hmm. is a wonderful example of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find it uh, far more important uh, for my own life than you know, putting on things. You mentioned Indian spirituality. Yeah. To, to what degree has uh, the celebration of Christmas uh, and, and certainly you know, many of the activities of, of the church and, and the manner in which it presents the teachings been Indianized? Uh, well, I would say that uh, in terms of teaching there's a long way to go uh, because uh, the message of Christianity is involved, that would not be that much of a problem, but the formulation of the message of Christianity, mm -hmm. which has become doctrine, mm -hmm. has to be translated mm -hmm. without sacrificing the core of what we teach. So that in the translation is obviously not just linguistic, because yeah, no. you are already doing it linguistically, correct. and, and correct, you know, correct, correct. ceremonies are performed in different languages. Correct. Uh, but what is it? What, what, what is what is that sort of the leap of faith or, or, or the leap that Christian doctrine would make yeah. uh, to Indianize itself in a sense? Yeah. See, uh, for instance, if we could take uh, Indian philosophy and see how the doctrine of the church could be formulated in those terms, most of it was done in uh, Greek philosophy. Uh, we had St. Thomas Aquinas, who did a great deal of this, mm -hmm. and many other scholars also. We need another St. Thomas to do this. Mm -hmm. Whereas, enculturation in terms of music, language, dance, and all that is already taking place. Mm -hmm. But uh, theology uh, is not that easy. There are efforts, uh, but uh, we have not done too much in this regard. You're watching the conversation with Archbishop Vincent, as we come down to Christmas, we'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Archbishop Vincent. We were talking about uh, you know, the <coughs> Indianization, in a sense, uh, of the faith. Um, but there is the universal dimension of uh, Christianity. Yes. And I know that you know, several other faiths, and certainly 
somebody like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who's you know preeminent Buddhist monk, uh, has done a commentary in the Bible and has celebrated uh, the, the the Christian tradition of service. And, and much of your life, you did a, a postgraduate degree in sociology, uh, has been faith applied. Yes. Uh, you know, not just sort of, you know, the, the, the abstract studying of, of, of the scriptures and, and, and pursuing God or divinity for its own sake, but the actual serving of fellow man. What is, what is this, this linkage between serving man, fellow man, and achieving heaven, peace, give us sort of, you know, the connection. Uh, reassure me, I, I, intellectually I am, that uh, it is through serving sure. man that I, I, you sure, know, I reach sure. the kingdom of, of heaven or, or whatever sort of that ultimate aspiration is. Yeah. Uh, that was the clear teaching of Jesus. See, uh, how do you love God whom you do not see if you don't love your neighbor whom you can see? And uh, Christmas uh, makes us recognize His presence in everybody. And I would say that is the depth of one's faith. It is not so much uh, determination and strong will that matters. It's often a clearer sight. Are we able to recognize His presence in others, God's presence in others? And this is something that was also uh, prevalent uh, in the mind of Mahatma Gandhi. I have a little uh, story about Vinoba Bhave, which I heard, you know, when he was going in his Padhyatra, in his Padhyatra and uh, a British journalist was accompanying him. Uh, and he walked many miles, met uh, lots of people. She was completely exhausted, whereas this man in his 70s looked very fresh. So she asked him, what's the secret of this? Mm -hmm. He said, how can I get tired? when I meet God two thousand times. <laughs> so when I yeah. look at, at, at fellow man, yes. and particularly if it's a fellow man who isn't you know, very kind to me and very generous and is sort of making my life difficult and miserable, what are the elements that I look for in him to remind me of, of, of God and, and divinity? Yeah, uh, it doesn't matter where that person is. He is a human being. And that means he is the goal of all of creation, mm -hmm. the rest of creation, the supreme value. Suppose we sort of we believe uh, United States propaganda and, and, and agree that uh, Osama bin Laden is the great Satan, or Saddam Hussein for that matter. But let's stay with Osama bin Laden. What? How would you lead me into recognizing or, or seeing divinity uh, in in say a terrorist, or someone who is causing yeah, yeah, deaths yeah. and suffering to millions of sure. people. Uh, it, it would be there hidden. The spark is there. It has to be uh, stirred and you know, you have to... Mm -hmm. uh, but it is there. And uh, we have uh, examples in history, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, dictators have become soft, I mean, totally different. Mm -hmm. Paul was a persecutor of Christians, mm -hmm. you know, and then he became an apostle. Mm -hmm. uh, spent his life on preaching the good news and love of Jesus. So, uh, again, it is the grace of God that has to work on each person. Mm -hmm. But then we can be instruments. Mm -hmm. you know, to so if you were to meet Mr. Osama bin Laden, what would you say to him to sort of see, to encourage him, help him see um, the vision of your God? Yeah. I mean, he obviously has a vision of his God. Yeah. And that might transform him into uh, a more humane, caring person in terms of our vocabulary, the God he has created, uh, he obviously believes, you know, offers him salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this really gets us to, uh, to, you know, to the roots of, you know, interfaith dialogue sure. and, and, and an area that you have been working very actively sure, sure, sure. Uh, towards. So, so how do you resolve these kinds of dichotomies? Yeah. I would say the best example is Jesus himself. For him, there was no sinner and saint. Every human being was uh, a son or daughter of God and therefore his brother or sister. And we have beautiful examples of how he transformed the lives of people. Uh, the case of uh, Zacchaeus, a tax collector, uh, whom society looked down upon, you know, 
he was curious to know what Jesus was like and he climbed a sycamore tree mm -hmm. and knowing that Jesus was a prophet what he would have expected was some sort of uh, condemnation but Jesus said the case come down I want to come to your house today and this man who had spent his life hoarding money cheating people all of a sudden becomes so generous half of my property I give to the poor he says and if I have cheated anybody I give fourfold mm -hmm. wonderful example there's the other example of the Samaritan woman mm -hmm. who was a sinner probably public sinner and Jesus asks her to give him a drink of water it was in you know, a breaking uh, the wall between men and women between Jew and Gentile between saint and sinner and this lady is surprised and in the conversation I don't know how long the dialogue took she recognizes him as the Messiah and she goes and tells people I've seen the Messiah the whole village comes to listen to him so uh, he did not see just the present or the past he saw what people could be mm -hmm. and interacted with them from that perspective mm -hmm. in other words he recognized mm -hmm. the image of his father in them mm -hmm. and that enabled them to recognize him mm -hmm. as one who came to free them from this enslavement to some uh, mindset some pattern uh, image of himself that he had mm -hmm. so the moment the self-image changes mm -hmm. your behavior changes but what happens and, and I think that this is a very uh, sort of uh, uh, elemental issue in, in interfaith reconciliation dialogue the celebration of diversity and that is that if I were to go and if I were to, if I were able to in, in, through enormous virtue and, and what have you uh, you know perhaps meet with Lord Jesus Christ and and, and say uh, that you know I, I, I'm an honorable man I'm trying to lead a good life and, and, and I uh, sort of uh, and I and I respect you as an, an honorable person but I don't believe in you I believe in somebody else in Lord Buddha or some somebody else what would he say to me? Would he accept me in, in, in the fold? Is it enough to subscribe to Christian values uh, of, of, of service and compassion and love of God and what have you without really believing in, in that specific form and, and, and an idea of a, yeah. a God that, that you embody and worship? Sure. Well, I would put it this way. Uh, it's a God called certain people to a certain way of life we say uh, it's a vocation you know now we are all called to share divine life we are all called to enter the kingdom of God one day but the ways may differ some are chosen for a particular mission and the mission of uh, the church of Christians is to be a witness to Jesus not enough to worship but to be a witness to Jesus to show by what we say and what we do and how we live that the risen Lord is alive he lives in our midst he continues his work of spreading the good message of God's love for all people mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and he will take you as you are mm -hmm. yes. you mentioned uh, entering the kingdom of God uh, you have also written about how important it is for, for religious traditions and, and religious leaders and, and people who preach the faith to respect science yes. and, and, and the conclusions and discoveries uh, of science uh, there is this sort of great debate in many countries in the education system for example between the evolutionists and, and, and oh, yeah. creationists how would you sort of address and, and, and resolve that? No, there is no contradiction between science and faith uh, we take science but also recognize its limits science cannot go beyond the visible the calculable the measurable but man's spirit can go beyond that and as long as science also recognizes its limits there should be no problem but if it doesn't mm -hmm. and it thinks it can explain faith and religion then I'm afraid it's going a little beyond <laughs> just as religion cannot go into the findings of science but accept them once they are proved. Yes. 
You're watching a conversation with Archbishop Vincent. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Archbishop Vincent, who leads the Roman Catholic congregation in Delhi. Um, we were talking about the relationship between uh, the Christian faith and, and, and Roman Catholicism and, 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 and uh, other traditions. Uh, sections of, of, of the right wing uh, in India have been distraught <coughs> and uncomfortable uh, with uh, the issue of conversions and, and believe and suggest that you know, very often uh, you know, the Christian tradition of service is being used to cajole people into adopting the Christian faith. Yeah, yeah. That's a common acquisition <laughs> by certain sections. Of so people. what do you say to them? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a misunderstanding of the Christian motivation. You serve because you are Christian. And if some other people want to serve and to find a way for this and want to become Christian, they're only exercising their uh, right, their freedom to be what they want to be, you know. It's as simple as that. So long as your motivation to serve isn't to have them convert to your faith, that's okay. It's sort of like yeah. a byproduct. No, I would no, I would not say that because, see, uh, as one chap <laughs> once told me very clearly, you see, I go to a doctor and uh, he doesn't uh, heal my child. I go to another one, he does it. Next time I meet anybody, I'll say, please go to that doctor, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So if Christ means a great deal for me, I would be the happiest person to share him with others, to tell others about him. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that man responds or not, it's not my responsibility. It's a matter between God and the individual, mm -hmm. you see. So you have to protect the value of freedom, mm -hmm. both of the one who wants to share mm -hmm. and the one with whom the good news is shared and uh, there should be no force or any other uh, coercion of any kind. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you see, with all these acquisitions, they have not found one case up to now mm -hmm. where there was a first conversion. Mm -hmm. This is propaganda made by certain sections of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, when you say ten times, some people will believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sort of t t t to move on, that uh, uh, there is also sort of concern that in many areas, you know, the Christian Church uh, and the Roman Catholic Church in particular hasn't kept up with the social realities, social imperatives. I mean, despite sort of the enormous contributions of service, uh, certainly in the issue of abortions. Uh, and, and, and how that relates to, to, to gender issues, gender rights, uh, sure. the issues of, uh, of divorce. I think they have come up against homosexuality in the church, uh, sexual abuse, um, uh, sort of several issues which are not, I, I hasten to add, exclusive to the church. I mean, the things that apply to, sure. to many traditions, but, but locating it in, in, in the discourse and in, in dialogue of the church. Uh, religion also has to be contextualized. But there are certain basic values and principles which will never change. And uh, the church is committed to that. Life is God's gift and we must protect it. To destroy it is an offense against God. We have no right to it. Same thing about divorce. They are united in marriage for life. Uh, there may be situations where one has to go through tremendous pain and struggle. Uh, we have come across cases. But then the same God who wants the couple to be united will give them the grace that is required. The question is whether they avail of this, whether they take the measures to look into themselves, or whether it is the passing trend that makes them easily give up the lifelong commitment they have made. Mm -hmm. See, uh, God cannot ask us to do the impossible, definitely not. Mm -hmm. But maybe we are not counting enough on Him mm -hmm. to enable us to do what He wants us to do. <laughs> That's the way I would look at it. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, when, uh, as, as sort of in, in Christmas we, um, we look at this, as, as, as you mentioned, God coming down to earth, God incarnating in human form. Yes. And so, in a sense, the, the, you know, the notion of incarnation becomes 
uh, extremely important. Sure. And, and, and what happens when God is in human form? Uh, is, 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 it, is God in some way changed? You know, we, we like to suggest that, uh, you know, there was immaculate conception in many traditions and so, you know, God isn't a woman born and didn't go through the traditional processes of procreation. Yeah. And I think it's, it's that, 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 that very notion, that idea that God is, is somehow pure and unsullied, uh, that, that under, you know, sort of is, is woven through the entire life of, of uh, you know, the divine incarnation. What is your understanding of, of, of a divine incarnation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're also I suggesting I in understand. some ways that you're God and I'm God. And we, we all have the potential I, I, to be I, God. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> no, there is a mystery about that and he would never cease to be a non-mystery. Mm -hmm. he, he will always be beyond our comprehension, always. Mm -hmm. You know, now when, even when I say that God became man, I, I cannot understand how it could happen. <laughs> because God is omnipresent, all-powerful, all-holy, how can he be confined to the figure of one individual? It's not possible to understand. Of course, in, in theology we speak of one person and two natures, divine and human. Uh, so united that there is no confusion, but he operates at different levels. But that does not in any way uh, soften the demand to surrender in faith. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, it is... Uh, and then again, it's a grace of God. I, I cannot say that I on my own do this, no. God enables me to surrender to something which I see as not unreasonable, but still I cannot understand fully. May I, in sort of signing off the program, as, 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 would it be fair to call you an intermediary in some ways between us and, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, may I sort of call on you, request you, ask of you for a blessing, uh, a chant, a, a message? No, a message is too prosaic. Something that we can reflect and sign off on. Yes, I would say now that Christmas is close, Christmas gives us hope. We are never alone, God is with us. And as Tagore himself said so beautifully, the birth of every child is a sign that God never gives up on us. We can always look forward to a better future and work at it with all of our might heart and soul. Archbishop, may I thank you for this blessing and of, of the conversation uh, with you and uh, it's been a, a deep honor. Thank you. Merry, merry, merry Christmas to thank you. Thank you. Same to you and Happy New Year to you.